Hi, I'm Liv and welcome back to The Book Nook. Hey guys, so I'm here with my other new best friend, the Owl Mug. Yes, I went back and got him. Well, I say I went back and got him the same day I had the Fox Mug. My mum was in town so I asked her if she could go and get him. Isn't he cute? Any cute. So for the people who've been asking about the Fox mug and this one on Instagram and everything, um, I get them, I've got them from a little sort of independent cookery, crockery shop in Exeter, but they are made by Price and Kensington. So if you're looking to buy your own, Price and Kensington. There's also a panda and I discovered there's a raccoon. I haven't seen the raccoon in the shop where I got this one yet, but I, I might, I might inquire. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about what I have been reading so far and what I'm going to be reading for the rest of non-fiction November. So I wasn't necessarily sure that I was going to do non-fiction November. Now, you guys will know I'm not the biggest non-fiction reader. I always have aspirations and plans to read more non-fiction than I actually ever do, if that makes sense. So I was a little on the fence as to whether I joined in this November, partly because with how crazy October had been, I hadn't sort of prepared anything and hadn't planned it. And also because... By the end of October, I only had something like 20 odd books left to read to hit 150 books this year. And I was a little bit cautious as to whether reading nonfiction, whether I would read nonfiction a fair bit slower and thus it would slow me down. And it's not that I'm going to be so focused on reading 150 books this year that I only pick books I think I can read within that, as it were. I'm not going to let that number dictate what I read because that would be foolish. But I was just sort of conscious of it. I was like, well, if I'm this close, I need to read a book about every three days. And it was something that was on my mind. But having said that, I finished playing Possum on the 31st of October. So a new day dawn on the 1st of November, as is, is wont to do. And I thought, OK, well, let's just start with a nonfiction book. So and I have then read only nonfiction so far. The other day, I nearly took a bit of a break for some fiction just because I was feeling really... I was having a bad mental health day and I thought, you know what, I need a break, I need to go to some fiction. But in the end, I didn't read anything for a couple of hours and then picked up another non-fiction book. So I'm going to go through what I have read so far for non-fiction November and then I'm going to look at what I am hopefully going to read for the rest of non-fiction November. Ow! That was all of my nail beds hitting the tripod at the same time, quite painfully. <laughs> I should say as well that Nonfiction November is something that's run by um, two other booktubers that I've only really discovered because of looking at Nonfiction November, and I'll link their channels down below. And it turned out that this year, and I only discovered this literally within the last five minutes while I was setting up to record this, that there are actually four sort of prompts for Nonfiction November this year. It's love, hate, scholarship and substance. And actually, so far, I think I've kind of hit those. And all the pick books that I've picked to read for the rest of November kind of fit those, I think we shall see. So the first one that I read in November was How To Be A Boy by Robert Webb. This one had been doing the rounds uh, when it came out about a month or so ago, it was hugely talked about, and I thought, okay, I'm gonna give it a go. Now, hmm, I think I was expecting something a little more Grayson Perry, Descent of Man-esque, whereas to me this was a decent enough biography that sort of touched on how to be a boy and how not to be a boy and sort of masculinity but it didn't quite go into the depths that I was necessarily expecting. So I wouldn't say I was disappointed, well I guess in a way I was because it wasn't quite what I was expecting but I think it's still a thoroughly solid readable biography and as I say there are hints in there and instances and it touches on sort of masculinity but for me didn't go quite, didn't penetrate quite deep enough into the sort of pitfalls of masculinity that Robert Webb seems to talk about having fallen into. He see, there seems to be a lot of talk about, I'm going to talk about it, and then not quite enough of talking about it for my liking. Then a book I read, which I have been meaning to read for absolutely yonks, and I'm thoroughly disappointed in myself that I haven't read it yet, and that is Ta-Nehisi Coates' Between the World and Me. This is essentially a letter, well, it's kind of split into two, it's two letters or essays written by Tanahesi Coates to his son, who is, I believe, 14 or 15 at the beginning of this, I've forgotten already, my memory is bad, and they are letters and essays about what it means to be black in America and about the black body. It's staggering work, this book. It made me 
angry, it made me scared, it made me... Before reading this, I had heard a few people say that ta Coates is kind of like the 21st century James Baldwin. Wait, I've got my centuries confused. Okay, let's just go with the modern day James Baldwin. I would say having read this not too long after having read um, James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, I can see that so beautifully and it's so... I don't know whether you've noticed, but the more I like a book, the harder I find it is to talk about. And that was definitely something I found all through my life when it comes to writing reviews or even like writing essays and things. If I was ever writing a critical essay of a book I didn't like, I could write thousands of words. When it came to writing something about a book I really loved, I really struggled. And this is still the case. Basically, everybody needs to read this book and if it doesn't make you angry and scared and want to do something, even if there's absolutely nothing you can really see to do other than reading this and listening, just read this. Go and read it. I am bad at the talky talking. Then I read a book that came out earlier on this year that I've heard lots of people talking about and that I picked a copy of up, put copy up of at the airport when I flew out to Porto and that is Maggie O'Farrell's I Am, I Am, I Am, 17 Brushes With Death. So this is a book that from what I can gather started as an essay or a letter to her daughter um, and it turned into this book and it's these 17 Brushes With Death and it's just dealing with mortality, motherhood, the self, how we are defined by moments of closeness with death or not, you know, how far does that become a part of who we are and how and how far does it shape the way we interact with the world? How much does it hold us back from things if we've had brushes with death and how far does it make us go to life? And you just find yourself thinking, how can a human think like this and have the skill to write it down? And then it charts this progression through her life and her acquaintance with death to her daughter. So her daughter has severe, severe eczema and also has severe anaphylaxis. Is it anaphylaxia? Anaphylaxis, that's it. And Maggie talks about how this level of protection for your child, of course, is just so all-consuming and, and how, again, it makes you reevaluate your relationship with death. I would thoroughly, thoroughly recommend this one. That's all I can say about that. Go and read it. Then I decided to go for a book that I had picked up a little while ago. When I'd heard it was coming out, I was quite intrigued, and that is Sigurd Rousing's Mayhem. Now, Sigurd Rousing, of course, is the um, heiress of the Tetra Pak family, um, and also the editor of Granta magazine, and all to do with that. So it's a memoir about Sigurd Rousing's family, but more particularly her brother Hans and his wife Ava, who are drug addicts, and then in 2012, Ava overdoses and dies. And it is this this memoir that deals with addiction. Now, funny enough, I decided to read it because the day before I picked this up, um, I sold a copy to a customer in a bookshop and we were talking and, and they were, this customer was saying that she'd heard some, some quite bad reviews about it. And I was sort of like, oh, really? And she was saying, yeah, that she'd heard reviews that it was quite sort of selfish and quite insular. Um, and, and I was sort of quite intrigued by that. And then she mentioned that, you know, she had a son who had suffered from addiction. So from her perspective, she was interested to see another sort of relative's perspective and, and looking at how the family deals with that. So I went into this one thinking, OK, I was quite intrigued because I knew nothing about this. But apparently, you know, at the time it was in the news and things like that. And, um, and then also with this at the back of my mind of how do you write about addiction if you are not the addict or the recovered addict or... Yeah, and it was quite an interesting one, this one, because her and her brother have this this strange relationship, they're quite close when they're younger, and then they drift apart because of Hans's addiction, and yeah, I was a little unsure about this one, having read it now, I'm a little on the fence, I can see what some of those reviews mean about it possibly being a bit selfish, but I think Sigurd Rousing addresses that, in the book, she says that, you know, a, a lot of the time that it's it's very difficult, because her reception of all of what was going on is very different from her husband's and her mother's and, and Hans and Ava's children and the extended family all around. So I think she addresses that, but it was one... Now, I don't know whether it is just the turn of phrase and a cultural thing with some of the, the sort of phrasings and things in here, but there were some sort of instances and, and paragraphs and sections that just sort of felt a little removed. I'm not quite sure why. But on on the whole, I think, again, a solid read and an interesting look at addiction and how it impacts the family 
um, but I think possibly not quite as much insight as I was expecting. I think memoirs are such a tricky thing, and I don't know whether a lot of my reception of non-fiction is down to the fact that I don't read much non-fiction, so I don't feel as qualified to say what makes a good memoir or what makes good non-fiction. This is all just what I'm thinking as I finish reading these books. I would say my favourite book that I have read so far, which is the one that I read after Mayhem, is Maggie Nelson's The Red Parts. Now, I have been meaning to read this ever since the lovely guys at Vintage sent me a copy. I loved Maggie Nelson's The Argonauts when I read it a little while ago. I still think that Simon Savage has got the best sort of uh, way of summing the Argonauts up, where she just puts all these, uh, opens up your head, puts all these ideas in, closes your head and shakes you up to think about it. And part of that is her prose and the way she writes, and she's obviously a, a fiercely intelligent woman, and um, I just thoroughly enjoyed reading that one, and I was really, really intrigued by this one. So this book, The Red Parts, so Maggie Nelson was writing a book of poetry about her aunt, Jane, who was murdered before Maggie Nelson was born. So she never knew her aunt, but she was writing this book of poetry about the murder of Jane, which was, they thought, resolved. Essentially, there had been the Michigan murders that were happening where this guy was convicted of killing sort of seven young women in Michigan. And Jane's murder was, was sort of convicted as part of that. But there was always something slightly different about Jane's murder as opposed to the other six. So 36 years later, the week that Maggie Nelson's book of poetry goes goes live, goes published, goes published? Clever. Is published. The week that is published, the police get in touch with the family to say that they have actually been, for the last five years, working on Jane's murder as a case. It's been active again, and they think they have found the guy that killed her. And it's just this incredible exploration of kind of an interrupted grief, not so much for Maggie Nelson again, because she's quite she's quite candid about the fact that she she never knew Jane, and it's not that she was trying to sort of find out who Jane was necessarily, it's that she was trying to give Jane a voice with these poems. It wasn't about her sort of finding out who her aunt was, anything in a sort of selfish way. It was letting Jane's voice speak rather than being another one of these murdered girls. And the the sort of closeness with her family and the family dynamics I found absolutely fascinating. And the whole thing just works so beautifully because it deals with sort of these weird coincidences that happen and then also the absolute messiness of life. The fact that the trial... So when the trial begins... Maggie Nelson has just split up with the guy that she's in love with. So it's the absolute worst time for it to be happening. And she has to go in and live in a house with her mother again for, for the duration of the trial. And it's just beautifully rendered. Now, I, a little while ago, tried reading um, Emmanuel Carrere's The Adversary, which I know quite a few people really, really loved. And I couldn't quite get on board with it. And I didn't quite like... I don't know whether it was the translation, I don't know, but it didn't quite connect with me and I just found it a bit too uncomfortable. I feel like this book did what the adversary was trying to do without even trying to do it and did it many times better. And it also did a bunch of other stuff really well. If you can get hold of a copy of this, do. Now, I don't read a lot of true crime, but I'd say in the last sort of year or so, I've read a bit more true crime than I've ever done before. This is the best one so far. Maggie Nelson's prose, as I have said repeatedly, is just absolutely gorgeous. The way she renders things, the way she describes things internally that happen is just so... Then there's all the, the, the sort of procedural intrigue and, and that sort of thing, which is just so fascinating. And there are sort of strange things that crop up and, and even when it's all wrapped up you're kind of there thinking mm, I'm not sure if yeah it's just absolutely wonderful as a true crime book as a true crime book it's bloody brilliant as a non-fiction narrative memoir type book it's bloody fantastic and as a musing on grief family who you are it's just go read it now one that I have started that I'm not sure if I'm going to finish because I'm having some problems with it at the moment is Ben Judah's This Is London. I picked this up the other day because I'd gone 
into town and ended up having to wait around a few hours and when I wasn't expecting to, so I hadn't taken my book with me. So obviously I had to buy another one. And I had been eyeing this one up for a little while. And I'd been umming and ahhing and I thought, you know what? It's non-fiction November, I'm gonna go with something non-fiction-y and this is one I've been eyeing up. Now, hmm. So on the back it says, this is London in the eyes of its beggars, bankers, coppers, gangsters, carers, sex workers, and witch doctors. This is London in the voices of Arabs, Afghans, Nigerians, Poles, Romanians, and Russians. This is London as you've never seen it before. Now thus far, I'm finding it a little bit... There's like a mix of white guilt and white saviour in here that I'm finding a bit uncomfortable. There's an element for me thus far of look how amazing I am going into these situations to tell you these hidden stories. Um, that's just sitting a little uncomfortably. So I'm not quite sure on this one yet. I guess what I'm getting at is that actually thus far, in an attempt to kind of unother a lot of these people, it feels like it's othering them more. It feels like, so far, it's kind of playing and preying on this kind of there's too many foreigners in London feeling without any kind of balance or qualification of why that might be or anything like that. It's just feeling a little uncomfortable so far, so I'm not quite sure if I'm going to proceed with it, if I can push through this discomfort, if it's worth pushing through this discomfort or not. So if any of you have read This Is London by Ben Judah, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Does that feeling kind of pervade or does does something happen very soon that balances it out and, and turns it into something new? I'm just a little on the fence about this one. So yeah, we'll see what happens. Now for the books I am planning to read for the second half of Nonfiction November. Earlier on I started and I'll be honest with you, I haven't got very far. It's a Sunday, it's my last of four days off and I'm thinking about work tomorrow and I'm having this weird day where I'm not really doing anything constructive at all. I've definitely read more tweets and more articles on my phone today than I have read of any book. It's been an incredibly unproductive day. Since I woke up at eight o'clock, I've been telling myself I'll go and have a shower every half hour. I only have my shower at four o'clock. So yes, a very unproductive and very slow Sunday. I did start, I've read the first essay in Rebecca Solnit's The Mother of All Questions, Further Feminism. So this book is published by Granta and it's another volume of Essays on Feminism by Rebecca Solnit. So far, the first essay is really good, the second one is a longish one and her writing is quite dense. I'm There are a few sentences that I'm having to sort of go back on. Could just be because I'm tired and having a weird Sunday, but I think for the rest of this evening I'm going to give this one a break um, because I'm not quite in that mindset, but I am very excited to read the rest of it. Then I think tomorrow when I go back to work I'm going to take something that's not too taxing with me to read on my lunch breaks. So I'm going to give a go another little memoir that's I'm still not sure whether I sort of desperately want to read it but I'm going to give it a go. That's Simon Amstel's Help. And the interesting thing about this one that I think is a little bit cheeky um, is A the writing's very big and then on some pages you've got it just it feels a little bit like this could have been a bit of a slim but I'm thinking, not too taxing, but should be relatively interesting and relatively light-hearted, but also not, because it deals with um, sort of mental health and depression, loneliness, anxiety, that sort of thing. I'm going to give this one a go, take it to work. And something slightly different, I am finally going to get round to at least starting Carlo V. Nausgaard's Autumn. So this is the first in Carlo V. Nausgaard's Seasons Quartet. Cough, copying Ali Smith, cough that is a collection of essays to his daughter, who is about to be born. So they're very short essays, some of them are only like a page and a half, two pages. Um, his sort of hyper intense, hyper detailed observations of the world for his unborn daughter. I have also got a copy of Winter, but I don't think I'm gonna do both in one month. That'd be a bit too much now, Scott. I'm also going to try and read a book that I feel like I've been trying to read for most of this year, and it's just not happening. And that's Teju Cole's Known and Strange Things, his collection of essays. Again, it was one that I took on holiday with me, didn't start. Well, no, I read the preface, I think. Preface? Preface? But yeah, it seems to be one that I keep starting or going to start and then just not getting around to. So I'm gonna try and start this this month. If not, I may just like let it go until next year. And yeah, we'll see.
Another one I do quite want to try and fit in is one that I got a little while ago and that I was quite intrigued by, and that's Neither Wolf Nor Dog by Kent Nairburn on Forgotten Roads with an Indian Elder. This is a journey um, on the Western Dakotas, in the Western Dakotas, I should say, the story of two men, one white and one Native American, connected by their own understandings of life, yet struggling to find a common voice. So this was one when I bought it a little while back and hauled it. I said that it was something I was quite interested to to sort of read about a little bit more was uh, Native American culture. So um, I am quite excited to give this one. I've heard really good things about this one. Um, so I would like to get around to reading this one. And then the last biography that I think I'm going to give a go this month is Hillary Rodden Clinton's What Happened. I don't need to say much about this one, do I? No. So yeah, I'm interested to know any of your thoughts on the books I have chosen for non-fiction November. Oh, so yeah, I was saying that I think these mostly sort of fit the love, hate, scholarship and substance. So I think I've definitely got substance with Sigrid Rousing's Mayhem, and there's certainly some of that in This Is London. I'm expecting possibly some of that in a couple of the others as well that I haven't read yet. We shall see. Uh, scholarship, I, you know, Rebecca Solnit, she's basically a scholar, isn't she? Maggie Nelson again. I, I think there are a few here that tick those boxes to a degree. Sigrid Rousing talks a lot about that as well. So I think, for me, personally, that box is ticked. And Love and Hate, Maggie Farrell is all about love. Tanahesi Coates is all about love and hate and that kind of intersection culturally of that. And um, and I think there might be a little dose of hate in Hillary Rodham Clinton's biography. So that's what I have read thus far and I'm going to read next far if uh, non-fiction November. Have a little chat with me in the comments below about any of these books here that what I've talked about. I think... It's relatively safe to say I'm not going to get round to reading Nicola Barker's Happy before the announcement of the Goldsmiths Prize winner on the 16th. So is that this Tuesday or Wednesday? Neither. It's Thursday. Yeah, I just don't see it happening. I've tried to pick, I've tried to pick it up twice now and I've just not quite been in the right headspace for experimental fiction, which is really frustrating. Um, and it makes me, I don't want to say worried because that sounds really weird, but yeah, not quite in the right headspace. So that's a shame. Because it was the only one I had left. Because I'm not reading well, so. Of the Goldsmith shortlist that I've read so far, though, I think I would be happy if Sarah, ba Sarah Baum's A Line Made by Walking One, and there's been, I think a lot of people have loved that enough. I would be pretty chuffed if Playing Possum by Kevin Davey won, to be quite honest with you. I thought that was a stonking little book, and a really brave little book from an indie publisher that I'd love to see do well, so I'd be really pleased if that one won it. But there has been a lot of good talk about Nicola Barker's Happy as well, and of course John McGregor's Reservoir 13. I keep forgetting about that one because I read it a little while ago. That one probably stands quite a good chance. If Gwendolyn Riley's First Love wins it, I'll be quite annoyed, and if Will Self's phone wins it, I will seriously reconsider my relationship. So yes, thanks for watching this video. I will be back in the next one. Don't know what it is yet. I'm not organised yet. New Year's going to be organised. Never mind. See you next time. What is this?